Buenas tardes. Bienvenidos a este acto de conmemoración de cuatro décadas de relaciones entre dos universidades, la Universidad Wake Forest y la Universidad de Salamanca, que coincide además con nuestros 800 años, 40 y 800, una buena confluencia. Quiero agradecer, eh, después lo expresaré de manera más eh, extensa, la presencia del eh, el profesor Dr. Royan Kers, provost de la Universidad Wake Forest. Thank you uh, for these uh, years of collaboration and for the future too. Y también la presencia del excelentísimo señor Don Eduardo Garrigues, eh, embajador de España, que nos acompaña no por primera vez en la Universidad de Salamanca. Eh, hemos tenido ocasión de disfrutar de sus puntos de vista en torno a las relaciones entre España y Estados Unidos anteriormente. Eh, y escuchar también parte del de, eh, sentido que eh, tiene la, eh, históricamente esta relación, ¿no? a partir de nuestra la, la participación de España en la independencia de Estados Unidos, como el título de su conferencia señala. También me acompañan en la mesa la directora del programa Wake Forest de la Universidad de Salamanca, la señora Candela Gala. Muchas gracias por este trabajo tan exitoso durante todo este tiempo y la vicedecana de la Facultad de Filología, la profesora doctora Ana María Manzanas, a quien a continuación daré la palabra para dirigir las palabras de bienvenida en nombre de la facultad y continuar guiando el acto eh, eh, desde este momento. Por favor. Buenas tardes, uh, dear rector Rivero, dear provost Kirsch, ambassador Garrigues, dear Candelas Gala, dear friends and colleagues, On behalf of the Dean, it's such a pleasure to welcome you today to this Faculty of Philology and to this Aula Magna. It's already 40 years. So many students, professors, academic and intellectual exchanges. And as, that, as one of those very lucky exchange students, I must say quite a long time ago though, I have to say, it is such an incredible honor to have my two alma maters sitting together. Mm. And, you know, I have to be very brief, but I just want to say thank you. Muchas, muchas gracias for being here, for coming to us, for supporting this long-standing intercultural dialogue, and for widening our intellectual horizons on both sides of the Atlantic. Welcome to Salamanca. Welcome to the Faculty of Philology. Thank you. Bienvenidos. Ana, Rector, Candelas, and a wonderful speaker. Um, thanks in return. Um, this is my second day in Salamanca, <laughs> and I only wish I'd found it sooner. Um, and I must say, we are both honored and humbled to be allowed to celebrate our little 40 years <laughs> alongside your 800 feels. Um, <laughs> really powerful. Buenos tardes, deacons, and also wonderful other guests. Um, we have the enormous privilege of hearing now from Eduardo Garrigas, who is a true Renaissance man. As a diplomat, an international officer, he was the counselor to the Spanish delegation of the UN, advisor of the UN Security Council, representing Spain as ambassador, He has served in that role to four different countries, Namibia, Botswana, Norway, and Iceland. Back in 1989, he was the Consul General of Spain in Los Angeles, bookended his diplomatic service by serving in the same Consul General role in Puerto Rico in 2010. As a cultural leader, he has been the Director of the Institute of Spain in London and the Director General of the Casa de América in Madrid. As a scholar, He has organized important seminars, including at the National Gallery, National Portrait Gallery of the, of the Smithsonian, and he has written a remarkable array of books and articles on subjects ranging from the settlement of New Mexico, 18th century North America, he covers it all, and the life of one of his special subjects of expertise, Bernardo Galvez. In the media, he is frequently doing articles and op-eds in the major Spanish, media outlets, as well as U.S. outlets like the Los Angeles Times and ABC News. And if that weren't enough, 
He has twice won Spain's national prizes for his novels. Remarkable Renaissance man, we are honored to hear from you today. I give you, I give us all, Eduardo Garrigas. Thank you, thank you very much. Y buenas tardes a todos. Before I switch into English, my English is not perfect, but you are going to see that I hope that you will be able to understand my English. Uh, I would like to use very briefly a few words in Spanish, uh, using the tongue of Cervantes instead of Shakespeare. Y lo hago para darle las gracias muy especiales. Por un lado, las gracias, y por otro lado, la felicitación eh, muy cordial al rector de esta universidad, a don Ricardo Rivero Ortega, a quien tuve el gusto de conocer antes de que se presentase a las elecciones. Eh, creo que la universidad no puede estar en mejores manos. Eh, una persona con gran sensibilidad en todos los temas académicos, una persona que se vuelca en todos los temas en los que empieza y una de esas, eh, digamos, tareas en las que debo felicitarle, aparte de por llevar, eh, como está llevando a buen puerto, el importante aniversario de los 800 años de esta universidad, también eh, debo felicitarle por haber iniciado esos cursos de Global Studies que unen eh, eh, universidades de diversos puntos y concretamente es un vínculo más como la universidad que tiene con la Universidad de Wake Forest. Very good. So, Rector, congratulations sí. um, to the uh, Provost of Wake Forest. Uh, I thank you very much for your very kind introduction. I will first recognize a couple of other people, like la doctora Ana Manzano. Muchas felicidades y gracias por estar con nosotros. Eh, la doctora Candelas Gala, que eh, she helped me in organizing, in being able to come to this important event. Uh, you have to realize that for me, being a Spaniard and being uh, both, uh, you know, a lawyer and a diplomat, is important to be here at the seat of the university that has had such an important uh, professor, such an important people, some enlightened members of the faculty. I just saw in coming the uh, statue of Don Miguel de Unamuno, who has been for me one of the major sources of inspiration. And uh, really, uh, I, I feel I cannot uh, 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 disguise the fact that I, I am really moved to be here in this place today. Let me also recognize the Vice Provost of International Studies, Dr. Klein Harrison, who is sitting there. Thank you for being with us today. And Dr. Michelle Gillespie, if I pronounced it correctly. Thank you for coming, Dr. Uh, well, uh, going back to the presentation of uh, Dr. Rogan Kirsch, uh, I'm not taking time to deny the generous presentation. Uh, after a certain age, you realize that all the compliments are welcome, no matter whether they are more or less uh, justified. So that, thank you very much, and I take them. But on the other hand, mm, I am somewhat uh, concerned. Is it a difficult act to follow, in a way? Because I, I am wondering how I could uh, try to convey my interest in events that happened basically 200 years before in people like you, most of you are uh, teaching, uh, you know, current affairs, things that happen today, or even, uh, you know, preparing your, your students for the world of tomorrow. But in my case, I'm going to try to, to come back, to, to have a, a kind of flashback, as they would say in the movie business, and try to explain why something that happened a long time ago could have something to do with modern times. And the reason why I think this, to know these events and to recognize, for example, the Spanish support for the independence of the United States is important, um, I will try, first of all, 
to explain, in my opinion, what is uh, public diplomacy. For you, those who would like to have a certain uh, kind of follow up my speech, I'm going to speak, trying to not to be too long. Uh, I'm going to concentrate on the concept of public diplomacy, then a brief mention to the recent visit of the King of Spain to the US, uh, then a, also a rather brief description of what was the War of Independence of the United States, where the main uh, European allies were France and Spain. Um, then I have to deal with some of the negative stereotypes or cliches, because I think this had seeped through the channels of history and has still some things to do with how people in America and in other parts of the world consider Spain. And the, at last, I'm going to speak a few words about what I consider the legacy of Spain in America. Uh, talking about cultural diplomacy, um, I have to stress the fact that the image projected by a country on another country, in this case, Spain on the USA, is not only in the interest of historians, but also of political scientists and also of entrepreneurs who want to invest or trade with a, a huge market, which is the market that can provide not only Spain, but the Spanish-speaking countries. And these people should bear in mind that the valuation of their products, of their technology, it should not only uh, the, not only relies of you know of the quality of their products uh, and on objective elements, the way they can sell their their technology, their products, but other uh, other factors, and some of them are intangible, but they are still there. And for example, as a um, very clear example, I could mention the different way, the different uh, recognition that has had the Spanish help to the independence of the United States and the help from France. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you all know that the figure of Marquez de Lafayette is a household name in America, while the, uh, the, mil the Spanish uh, military from Malaga, Bernardo de Galvez, uh, who served the Spanish army during the same war. And uh, he not only conquered the, both sides of the Mississippi from the British, but also, uh, you know, he mm, won the Battle of Mobilia and of Pensacola. And by such, he was dominated not only the Gulf of Mexico, but the very strategic channel of the Bahamas. And this, in the development of the war, was something very, very important. As a matter of fact, many of the, uh, you know, of the American leaders of the time would recognize that without the help of Spain, of course, at the long run, America would have become independent, but probably in a different way. So, mm, you know, the fact that this has not been recognized immediately and that only about two or three years before, the Congress uh, proclaimed Bernardo de Galvez as uh, a, 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 as a honorary citizen of the U.S. is something that it, you know it, it attracts my attention not only as a historian, as a diplomat, but also I think uh, uh, as a person interested in the in, in the economy. Uh, this uh, uh, the winning of these different battles. Uh, you know, uh, prompted the King of Spain, Charles III, to, uh, to give a nobility title to Bernardo de Galvez. He, he was called, uh, you know, Conde de Galvez. And, you know, in the crest, in the, in, the, in the nobility crest, there was one of little corner in which you could see a, a little man, you know, uh, navigating in a small ship. Well, and this is why the, the code of arm would read, Yo solo. I alone. Why? Because at a very important situation, at a very important, how do you say, corner of history, when the Spanish fleet had denied the, uh, you know, the possibility of disembarking in Pensacola because of the many risks 
and especially because of the very well, uh, you know, uh, organized batteries and defending the mouth of the of of the uh, of the bay of Pensacola, Bernardo de Galvez, knowing that he had to go ahead, that he cannot who could not lead the people, the army who had already disembarked, and that he had behind the possibility of an attack by the British fleet, he himself, he just jumped into a little boat called Galveston, and he sailed in front of the batteries and miraculously survived. And then this is why he said, I did this yo solo, only alone. Well, uh, this could be considered maybe an uh, individual ask, uh, a task of bravery, of uh, even temerity, but um, he says something which has been the title of this novel, which has been presented in the university. Uh, in Spanish, is los que tengan valor que me sigan. In English, it would say, those who are brave enough, follow me. Mm -hmm. And this is not a bravado, this is something which in other words means those sharing my hope, my ambition, my self-commitment, my courage would have to follow me. And in this, the, 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 the behavior of a military leader will link with the, the uh, ideals and with, the, uh, you know, with all the philosophy uh, of a businessman. Because a businessman should, first of all, declare a name, an objective, may be difficult, maybe he has to risk something to attain it, he has to surround himself by people that will follow and will take the risk to go behind the leader, and this is how you could run a, you know, a, a, not only an army, but a big company and a big university. So maybe, Rector, <laughs> at some time you have to say, <laughs> those who are brave enough have to follow me, <laughs> probably. No? Well, that, that's the situation. You know, uh, but, but this, when I was talking about diplomacy, uh, uh, public diplomacy, what, what, what is the point for it? I think uh, I belong to a, to a foundation called Fundación uh, España Estados Unidos, who uh, deals with strengthening the links between both countries, uh, which I contributed. No, I did not create it myself, but with a group of people when I was director, director of Casa America. And this foundation, we have the, the, the main, uh, you know, uh, businessmen the, and, and directors of, executive directors of the firms, like we were talking before, the president Iberdrola, who has a very big operation in, in, in America, and who, by the way, organized this exhibit about Bernardo de Galvez in, in, in New Orleans that the king of Spain visited recently, and it's a wonderful exhibit. I mean, you could ask why these people that live so far away and they are already running an important operation should spend their money and their time in trying to explain to people to New Orleans or to Texas, like the King of Spain has done recently. Um, you know, what's the purpose? It's not only the idea of, you know, uh, what is uh, historical objectivity. Uh, it's not only about patriotism or a romantic thing. It is because, as we were mentioning before, the image of a country that contributes to the possibility of selling different products is also based in the perception of the people have about this country. And in this respect, the history, and in this sense, the common history between Spain and America is, is very important. I had the chance of uh, organizing, or at least uh, Yes, coordinating a major exhibit with the Smithsonian Institution in Washington that it was called Legacy, and it was uh, organized with the, uh, you know, with the Portrait Gallery, where we had the, it was a fantastic exhibit. We had more than five Goyas, the big size Goyas, and many other important artists, and we had, uh, after that, a very interesting a seminar that uh, the provost has mentioned, where we had the uh, you know different important historians uh, Enrique Krause, uh, Felipe Fernandez Armesto, uh, we had Emilio Lamo Espinosa from Spain. I mean, the whole operation costed one million three hundred thousand dollars, which, by any uh, you know uh, standard, is is a lot of money. 
But, I mean, why they wanted to spend this kind of money? Why? Because they wanted to kind of reflect in the core of the, uh, uh, of the American political life, which is Washington, what Spain had done to help the independence of the United States. And you will be surprised that important newspapers like the Washington Post, they had a very positive and, uh, you know, re reflection and very positive comments on the exhibition. But there was also a hint of surprise. I mean, they say, oh, suddenly, I mean, I, we didn't know that Spain had helped so much for the, for the American independence, but that was the case. And so, uh, coming to the, to the basic facts, in an article that I published in El Mundo about those dates, it's September 2007, and the article was called Galvez versus Lafayette. And I dare to express in this article, putting it in a nutshell, that the difference between 15 and 20 dollars of a good or even very good Rioja wine a, to the favor of an indifferent Bordeaux wine. I mean, if you are paying $20 or $15 more to this not so good French wine, is because people in America know what France did for the United States while they didn't know what Spain done. So it is a very, maybe, I don't know, it is a very prosaic way of trying to define history, but that's the, the way I feel it. So this is why talking about expenses and, and trying, uh, you know, to, 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 to spread the word of the common history, the visit, the recent visit of the King of Spain, Felipe VI, to both, uh, you know, Texas, then Louisiana, and then to Washington, was in many respects prompted by an idea of cultural diplomacy. Uh, the king eventually did meet with the President of the United States, but this is in a, diff in a different box, in a different scenario. He mainly went to the area where, in the case of San Antonio, they were celebrating the 350th anniversary of the creation. In the case of, of New Orleans, which was at one point French, but then immediately Spanish. He was also celebrating the 300 years of the foundation. And the King of Spain went there, and by the way, I have here, well, I, I had, although I didn't go to the exhibit, I cooperated in a way I'm just going to tell you by giving some of the documents that were used for this time and rereading some of the uh, King's uh, speeches. I just bump into one, uh, you know, uh, phrase that the king mentioned in a very respectful way, like there's the matter of talking of the kings, that I'm afraid that Spain history in Louisiana is not yet adequately known. And this is not because of lack of historians and scholars who have done very well their job. It's because this, for some different reason, could not get into the general public opinion. And this is what the king of Spain says. So I think the king in this respect was absolutely right. Now, I have to come to the third point of my uh, uh, chat, which is the recognition of the Spanish support of the independence of the United States. And I think talking only about cultural diplomacy or even talking later about some of these stereotypes that I will be interested in underscoring will not be enough if you don't get at least a glimpse of what this war was, well, for Spain, you know very well what it was for the United States. But uh, I, it just crossed my mind that when I was Consul General in Los Angeles, I had an interest for the movie industry. And even because I have been for some time an author, I went to one of the, these big uh, firms, one of the big, big studies. I said, okay, well, I have some ideas. You know, I have written a novel, 350 pages. And I said, okay, very good. If you are able to you know, explain to me in three and a half minutes what mm. these 350 pages are, we can discuss. So I will try not to explain in three minutes, but maybe just a little more what the war was about. We have to go back just a few years before, in uh, 1763, there was a piece of Paris, which was before the peace of, 18, uh, of 1783, in which uh, by this peace ended what in America you call the, the French and Indian War. And uh, in Spain we know more of the Seven Years' War, 
o también la, la guerra de sucesión, because for us it was a, well, this war ended in a total, uh, you know, uh, it was a, a total in total distress for both Spain and France. Uh, England uh, won the war, but one thing important is as a uh, war compensation, France lost all their territories in Northern America. They lost Canada, which was very important for them, and they, because of this uh, war indemnity, uh, the king of France, you know, at that time, the monarch just signed the paper and they gave bits of their, uh, of their possessions like this. I wish I could do the same. And, uh, and uh, so uh, the king of France gave the whole territory of the Louisiana, which was, by the way, a broad and extensive and, and rather imprecise territory, which then in turn creates some problems uh, to Spain. What is important is that although Spain had also lost the war, but it has not lost all their territories, neither, of course, in Southern America nor in uh, either in North America. And this placed Spain and France in a different totally different situation. Because when the uh, rebellion arose in the, in the colonies of, of New England, uh, and there was a delegation, there was a secret uh, committee organized by the Congress of the times, and uh, they said they wanted to send Jefferson, but because of a personal situation, he could not go. So they sent Benjamin Franklin, uh, Silvia, uh, uh, Silas Dean, and um, the last name I will remember in a minute, they sent this three-member delegation to uh, France, to Paris. They were hoping to get the help of both France and Spain, because uh, France was still a powerful country. They had a military, uh, you know, a very powerful army, and Spain still had an important fleet. Remember that our decline of our fleet came a few, many years later, during the Battle of Trafalgar. So, at that time, uh, Washington, General Washington, realized that without the help of these, uh, you know, uh, European powers, they could not win the war against their powerful metropolis. And, of course, the, for France to accept this cooperation and this alliance was relatively easy, for one reason. They had nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. While for Spain, we had to keep in mind that by declaring war to England, you know, we had a lot to lose because, first of all, we had all the territory, not only still what, what belonged to us in, the, in, in, in America. Remember that two-thirds of what is now the continental territory of the United States was at one point Spanish, at least nominally. Although there were not cities, it was underpopulated, but it was Spanish, but also in the, in, in the southern hemisphere, where the, the British could inflict a lot of damage by interrupting the communication. At that time, the Spanish state was living out of the, the, the monies that were sent from America. And that, we had to think it twice. So if you, if you follow me and, and can imagine in a, a palace in the Rive Gauche of, of Paris, when Conde de Aranda, who was a, 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 a Aragonese aristocrat, who was three times a Spanish grandee, not, not, as they say, the bad translation, a big of Spain, no, it's grandee, okay. It, he was three times grandee, which is a big title, but also had a huge quantity of different titles, and he was meeting these people who were uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin and his other partners, uh, uh, and then, you know, Benjamin Franklin took a little paper out of his cassock and he said, okay, this is what I want you to sign. I said, what, what is this? Well, it's very simple. It's, it's a treaty of common interest, commerce, and friendship between the United States and Spain. And of course, at that time, you know, the, the heart attack was not yet fashionable, but I suppose that uh, probably uh, Aranda would have had at least a fit or whatever it was fashionable of, of the time. Because there was not only, you know, a diplomatic, how do you say, encounter, it was the encounter of two worlds. On the one side, you had 
these people that had rebelled against their country, and the other side there was this old-fashioned aristocrat that, although he was supposed to be a friend of Voltaire, that, that's nonsense. They had just exchanged some gifts and things. It was very superficial, but he was still, uh, El Conde de Aranda, was a very clever man, and he, he was able to impose or, or to, to, to put before the interest of his country rather than his own convictions. How? Well, although he was reluctant to give recognition to these rebels, to, his, to, their, to, to, to their loyal uh, you know, king, he advised the court of Madrid to declare the war to England, among other things, because he thought, and I am also, I remember almost literally what he said, we ha this is an occasion probably unique of inflicting a big damage to our common enemy. And they had this vision, but, and I'm trying to restrict my time, uh, this vision was not shared by either the King of Spain, Charles III, who was somewhat reluctant to recognize this rebellion. You know, the, the help of Spain was very important, both financially and because of the different, uh, you know, provisions and different elements that they said, but also because of these important uh, battles in the south. Uh, this was almost unknown in, in many of the, uh, you know, uh, leaders of the rebellion. So eventually what has happened is that when we sent our first ambassador, who was Diego de Maradoki, in order to try to secure two important things. One was we claim exclusive rights of navigation for the Mississippi, and also to delegate the frontiers that were very vague, you know. And Britain, who is a very, you know, the, the, the British diplomats are fantastic and pretty cunning, uh, you know, uh, they had that something a little bit in which they have uh, cooperated with the Americans, and it was John Jay, the one who later became the first um, Secretary of State of the United States, and he went to London. And before the Treaty of 1783 was signed, uh, we had a, they had a private agreement in which England very generously gave the United States a territory that, that, that was no longer there. And you know, in this situation, our first ambassador uh, totally, I mean, he, 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 he could not either uh, uh, discuss with the Congress the, uh, the exclusive rights of the navigation of the Mississippi or he could retrace the, the frontier. So, um, this, this is something which was bad for the following relationship. And I would like to, at this point, uh, try to analyze why this important help in many ways of Spain was not duly recognized, publicized, and developed well. Uh, we have talked about the ambivalence, which is not a good thing to follow. The other thing is that Spain had this fear of that the, this was a bad example for the possible revolution, which was already started in some of the southern territories. And obviously, and I think the main reason there was a clash of interest between the Spanish uh, in crowd, which claimed a lot of the territory. We have already what is now Texas and uh, New Mexico and California, but the territory of the Louisiana was not very clearly predicted. Uh, so, um, the fact is that many of the citizens of the United States, once England had left, they wanted to invade the territory that was the third country, which was called the Indian and the Spanish, and this will clash with the ideas of Spain and wanted to retain this as, a, as, a, you know, as part of their territory that was, had been won in part by the Conquest of America. Uh, there are some other important elements, and when I talk, I hope I'm not being too fussy or too trying to, uh, you know, go myself many years back to the famous black legend. But when I mention some of the stereotypes, because these stereotypes 
I had had a very, how you say, close and very recent experience of, of, of what happened. For example, I was consulting in Los Angeles in uh, 1992, which was, as you probably remember, the date of the, uh, uh, the Queen's Centenary of the Columbus Voyage. And at that time, because, you know, Los Angeles was surrounded by a territory in which there were many Indians, there was a lot of controversy. And there was a lot of controversy. I had invited the consul to the center in the morning, the 16th of 17th, Cristobal Colón, named the same way, and Duque de Leal. And we had to put some uh, kind of, uh, you know, well, the security around that because he was, you know, he was a Navy officer, very well, you know, uh, home and disposed of him. But he, he, he had uh, the catches was a little move. So when they put uh, the you know, bullet test in these uh, catches, she almost disappeared. And we had we, we this problem of having the, the, the tournament of roses. Some of you might have heard of the tournament of roses because this will be the first year, the, the first of January of uh, the 1990. And on the 12th, which was the day of the, at least we believe that it was the day of the landing of Columbus in the uh, American or either the Antillas, uh, to a friend who was the uh, editor of the of the Los Angeles Times, I published an article and in that very day he said that it was an open uh, article and he was I didn't have it, but the title they put the pathology of Nero Make. This is something that I was going to take it but I could not find it is there somewhere. It was called the pathology of Nero Make. And what I was trying to describe, I was a bit surprised at why uh, Columbus, Christopher Columbus, that what had been uh, ill at the previous centennial, which was in Chicago, in uh, 1890, it was in 1990, it was in it was the You know, he had been treated as, as a fantastic, uh, how to say, pioneer and, and promoter of the civilization. And he was actually, there was uh, this figure of Columbus uh, 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 riding a chariot, you know, a marble chariot with horses. It was the uh, uh, fantastic. It was, in a way, the, 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 the incarnation of, of the American It was not the vaquero, but something very similar. And suddenly, 100 years later, when they discovered that he was yet an Italian, maybe more in general, but he was the agent of this, uh, you know, fanatic and aggressive empire of Spain, that he was totally demoted from his pedestal. And I wrote these letters, if you allow me to quote my own article. The American public remained puzzled over the significance of the Columbus celebrations, as, as this October 12th marked the 500th anniversary of his first wife voyage, some are even suggesting that Columbus Day be deleted from the country. The navigator, who once was considered the incarnation of the spirit of freedom and enterprise, had been recently accused of being not only an incompetent sailor and a dishonest administrator, but also the agent of the sinister Spanish Armada, bringing justice and then this was, I don't go on with the article, but I, I kind of uh, voiced my surprise at how this could happen in such a different time. But this, I think, this uh, vision of, 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 of this, how do you say, uh, evaluation of historical facts had had a long story. And whether or not the same year, is Jackson Turner, the famous historian, American historian. This is when he, uh, he gave his famous lecture, lecture about closing of the American frontier. And this, which was first of an article, it was a book which I have, it, 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 it presented the history of America as related to the fact that uh, in many ways America has taking all the values and the attitude of the people that made the rush to
to the to the sun. And he says, the Frederick Jackson Turner says, the I'm quoting, the existence of an area of the land in continuous recession and the advance of American settlement westward explain American development. I finished the quote. Another quote. That covetousness and strength combined with the cuteness and acquisitiveness of the pronunciation, that masterful grasp, grasp of material in plant that dominant individual. Mm -hmm. And then Turner and the history of Turner, who had a lot of influence in, in, in American history, was trying to explain the American mentality and even the democratic mentality of America to this spirit of liberty of individualism that goes with this idea of the, you know, the, the, the march from the east to the west. But as, for example, Patricia Nelson did, who is a you know, historian from the University of Boulder, Colorado, pointed out, is that one of the shortcomings of Turner's argument is that he ignored the racial and ethnic minorities that already existed in the West, the Indian tribes and the Hispanic communities, and he never mentioned the existence of a previous Hispanic frontier, the frontier that was discussing, uh, you know, Bernardo Alves and uh, Aranda and uh, uh, the Pasa from the other country with the Americans. And, and this Spanish frontier sometimes it served as a bridge and some others as a barrier, but in fact, it did exist. So, uh, the, the idea of uh, Patricia Nelson Liberty, which I totally share, is that the depiction of uh, Turner's writing is that it describes this frontier as moving only in one direction physical and mental. Migration of these white English speaking people, where according to Turner's theory, they were exploring the Western. And it was like an empty and idyllic landscape, which was not, where the Indians appeared more as symbols rather than tri dimensional human beings. And this was a shortcut. But uh, <clears throat> this was only, let's say, I was at the beginning of, of, of the chat mentioning about these ideas, stereotypes, seeping through the different layers of history. And we have to remember that um, I don't like the idea of the, <coughs> the, uh, of the black legend, because what is black legend, what was true, what was not, I don't like to discuss this. But what is true is that there were some stereotypes and also some unfair comparison between different parts of, 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 of different possibility and different ways of conversation. And, you know, I have been not posted but traveling to Mexico, I have been traveling and been ambassador to different parts of, of, of Africa. And, you know, in Mexico I found university, I guess one, I found cathedrals, I found big hospital. I did not find any of those in Kenya or in Namibia where I have been ambassador. So, we, I don't think that the colonization was that bad, but for example, there's something I could mention that example, but there is talking about stereotypes. It's very interesting to mention that in 1777, which some of you might remember, is the date of the Battle of Saratoga. Saratoga being the first major victory of the rebels done by uh, General Gates uh, against the, the, the metropolis. And not only that, it was the battle that prompted. The, uh, the alliance of France and later of Spain, because it showed that this rebel could, could, could destroy and could win the, the war. Well, that very day in Dublin, uh, you know, Robertson, Robertson published in Edinburgh, no, sorry, I'm saying uh, uh, Edinburgh, um, <clears throat> a, a book called History of America. And, uh, you know, this writing and other of this kind it lead readers to believe, believe that, that that cruel, rapacious Spaniards 
came to the new world in search of treasure mines and to live in idleness on the toil and sweat of exploited Indian slavery. This was supposed as the contrasting the, this attitude with the English colonists who came to the new world to build homes, to farm and to work with their own hands. Although this dichotomy between the Spanish pig and the English home has been many times uh, discussed, but this is something which in many ways has permeated the general understanding of what happened not only in, in North America, but especially in South America. So, at this point, I should try to talk because I have only five minutes left to say, well, were the Spaniards that bad? Was their way of communication so, so non -stupid? Well, mm, I have learned some of this history because being consul in Los Angeles, I traveled extensively in the Southwest. And at one point, I, I, even my wife, Pilar, who was there, and myself had the uh, uh, both, uh, you know, a little, I don't know, the one has some land, a little ranch, north of, of Santa Fe. And we became very interested in all that was the relationship, first with the old Hispanics, let's call them Hispanic, but they were direct descendant of the Spanish, but also with the Indian population. And I made a point as there were this uh, controversy, controversy and this problem. I visited the main tribes, you know, and even I became, you know, I had interest in discussion and at one point in the summer of 1990, I took 12 Indian leaders to the University of Tulsa and made them visit the, the, the Sepulchro, the film, the second, but the one signing the, 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 you know, the, 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 the diploma to conquer those territories. And that was very, very, very interesting. I'm talking about 12 Indian leaders, and one of them, for example, I think it was James Kina, he was the overall leader of the Pueblos, which are 19 different tribes. And so this was interesting, by the way, as you are sitting there, it was in the University of uh, Complutense in Korea, uh, the Queen of Spain at the time, Sophia, came as a as a as a mother. And she was in kind of blessed by one of the of the Indian shamans. So do you have do you have any shamans around here? No? So we cannot do this blessing. Anyway, in, let me tell you, I think uh, somehow this uh, you know, entradas of Spain from Mexico had been somewhat represented. I like to see this entrada more like a quixotic, uh, how do you say, uh, movement than of really an act of colonization. For example, when, when, when Francisco Vázquez Coronado came from the uh, Amistad, he was, he was governor there, to what is now Arizona in New Mexico, he was looking for an kind of uh, 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 chimera uh, uh, called the seven cities of Sibor. And he was totally, you know, he was looking like the will of a twist, going in the, in, the, in, the, in the big prairies, he could find nothing. And I, I think it's rather pathetic what eventually he would have been looking for these beautiful cities covered with gold and paved with diamonds. And he has to, at some time, he writes to the viceroy. Uh, the, the great Antonio there, and I'm quoting in English, but I think he, he's telling about what the Entrada has been, and he ends up by saying, It now remains me, it, it remains for me to tell you about the seven cities, this Chimera, the kingdom and the province, of which the father provincial, by Marco de Vita, what his letter had given you know, to gave your lordship an account. And he, he, he concludes, not to be too verbose, I can assure you that he has not told the truth in a single thing that you say. Not only that, but everything is the opposite of what he relates, <laughs> except the name of the cities and the large stone houses. Because these cities were only the Pueblo, uh, I don't know if you have or seen or seen pictures of Taos, for example, and these are built in adobe, but they are sometimes mica composites. And then in the, in the reflection of sunset, they look like golden cities. They were not, they were very golden cities, and 
that was the, the goal to achieve it. So <coughs> it, I think this we have not to to to, uh, to dismiss the fact that these people were very poorly informed and they were going somewhere without knowing exactly where. But although they were not successful in their quest, this is what uh, Eugene Herbert Bolton, who is the creator of the he's opposing someone's vision of, of, of Turner because Bolton believes that the Spanish colonization was inclusive. Why, uh, you know, uh, uh, Frederick Jackson Turner, he talked about uh, exclusion, and he said, he said, this is what says this, even recognizing the failure, let's say, in his book, uh, is, is called Coronado, Night of Pueblos and Plains, and I quote Bolton, first among the Europeans, Coronado and his men saw and described on the basis of eyewitness information, the Tunye Pueblos, the Hopi Pueblos, the Colorado River, the Grand Canyon, the Tikes, and, and, and now the San de Cristo, which is the, 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 you know, the, the, the uh, southern part of the Rockies, the Peco River, the Canadian River, and these vast herds of buffaloes that they call Tibolos in Spain at the time. The buffaloes were all called Fibolos and the great canyons of the state plan. So what, what both of you say, yes, they were not successful in their quest, but at least they let, you know, they explore all this past territory that now is what we call the Far West. And in this respect, although uh, there is this famous author of the Southwest called Tony Hiller, he's an author of, uh, you know, I'm sure that some of them have been you know, he, he writes about the Oñate and Tala, which came sometime later, in 1598. Incidentally, for those who don't know, Oñate did what you could call the, the, the Thanksgiving Day, 20 years before the period of the And that was in 1598. And this is what Tony uh, Hillerman mentioned about this specific entrada and the crossing of the Rio Grande, which is where the King of Spain has been recently. He says, I'm quoting Tony Gilman. Looking at this tiny column through the perspective of history helps one understand why the Indian cultures in its past survived, while those of Eastern America did not. The English brought with them the concept of racial superiority and metaphysic of Puritanism, Calvinism and the idea of salvation of the elect and damnation of the many. Among the English and the Dutch, there were no niggling, time-wasting doubts and arguments about Indians. Unless they got in their way, they were left alone. If the white man wanted the land, they were driven out or exterminated, with neither malice or intended cruelty. This is what finish of the quote uh, mentioned to say. But to finish, I have just three minutes left. What I consider important and has to be, uh, you know, to be considered in, on, 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 on the whole scope of what Spain did with America, I think it's important to mention uh, what was the positive areas of the Spanish legacy. One of them was a set of values, and not only we are not talking about religion, about this philosophy or of a different mentality that in part belonged to this university. For example, there was the legal. People don't realize that for many years the Southwest had been run by the Spanish legal principle. And I am working on a, on a project which is to try to describe something that was called the El Paso Soul War. We are talking about um, 1877, and it was very simple because of the clash of different mentalities, there was a war between uh, the people of the community, which were mainly Mexican, that were explo exploiting some, some salt, the salinas, salt, the atinienta, so, so lakes, and people from the east that wanted to grasp them and to control it individually. So it was a clash of two different cultures. One is the communal idea, that perhaps as you were in well known, of the Código de Siete Partidas and la Recopilación de las Leyes de India and the Common Law, which give the, the property to individuals. So this is also important, but most of it, most of it, 
we can talk about the Spanish language, which, as the thing mentioned, is spoken by maybe only in, in, in you know, maybe 35, 40 million in the States. And I have to have language about my travel back again. I have two books that I wanted to show to you. I value them very much. And they are totally, you know, they are totally, how you say, out of print. One of them is called The Dictionary of the Old West by Peter Watts. And this, what is interesting is that you, this is not a Spanish language dictionary. This is a dictionary of the West where you can find only the first page, you know, Abra, which means, of course, Puerto. Atequia, the irrigation channel, Atiol, which is one of the parts of the saddle or the horse, Agarita, the white current, Agregado, Agrito, Aguarete. I'm, not, I'm just talking the first few pages. Aguamote, Alameda, Ayam, well, you know, I, I thought one interesting entry was about the Musta. Many of us who have heard about the Musta, they say, well, the Musta is famous the car by four, uh, which maybe uh, it takes the, the, the name of an Indian leader or something. No, it comes from the Spanish Amesta, Amesta which was created on the 12th century. And you know, this, uh, I, I have a very good collection of books and one of them is by Frank Dobby, which is great, he knows a lot about the Southwest. And it, it says, it is the ancient corruption of Mestenia, or Mestenia, a word already legalized in Spain when Copernicus accepted the rotation of the earth in 1273. So, this musta, which seems a typical English and, and American word, actually comes from Anyway, the other one, which is maybe it doesn't look very elegant, but I value it very much, it cost me exactly $3.50. So, no, no, 350 $3.50. And it's called Spanish Terms for Forest Rangers. It is published by the Forest Service of the Southwestern District, and it was published in 19, not 18, 1921. What it means, and I'm not going to read because it's all terms of what, you know, it is lumber, la madera, more tabla, uh, you know, pure wood, la leña. But what proves this is that the forest ranger in the whole uh, Southwest area. If he wanted to go out of the city and visit a village or a farm or an atienda, he had to take this in his pocket because otherwise he would not be understood. So I think to me is something really, really moving. And I would like if you allow me to finish with something which I'm not written, but something much better, I mean, much more poetic and much more inspired, uh, who is Pablo Neruda talking about the time. I'm going to read it in, in Spanish, but the broad translation will be such a good language that the Spaniards brought because they were looking for gold, they took all the gold, but then left us the gold of the world. Mm -hmm. And this is what Neruda says. Qué buen idioma el mío. Qué buena lengua heredamos de los conquistadores torpes. Estos andaban atancadas por las tremendas cordilleras por las Américas encrespadas, pero los bárbaros se les caían de las botas, de las barbas, de los yelmos, de las herraduras, como piedrecitas, las palabras. Luminosas que se quedaron aquí resplandecientes. El idioma. Salimos perdiendo, salimos ganando, se llevaron el oro y nos dejaron el oro. Se lo llevaron todo y nos dejaron todo, nos dejaron las palabras. Yo quiero agradecer a Eduardo Rodríguez de nuevo sus palabras, su fantástica presentación de las raíces que nos unen y el haber aprendido el origen de la palabra Mustang tan pertinente. Y bueno, al Provost, profesor Rogan. Yes, the Vice Provost for Global Affairs, Mr. Klein Hanson, the Dean of the College, is Michel Rousseau, the Mr. Candela Sgada, the Director of the Program, the Teacher and Director of the Program in Salamanca, 
Uh, and the rest of companions, companions and friends of the really long and close relationship between the Universidad de Salamanca and Wake Forest University. Since I couldn't have turned out uh, any other way, my first words must be to give thanks to Wake Forest University. Revit en español, pero ahora quiero que el rector también escuche words of acknowledgement for your initiative to share the commemorations of the 8th centenary of our institution by organizing this meeting of former students of your program in Salamanca. We are deeply honored for the invitation and we are happy to participate in your celebration. Wake Forest University began its uh, study program in Salamanca in the in the second half of the 70s, uh, well, they were kids. Uh, in the beginning, it was a cooperative program called in the classroom of the faculty this faculty of theology. It was promoted by a large number of professors from different specialties in the area of humanities. As you all know, 40 years of Fruitful collaboration between both universities are now deep fulfilled. We are very pleased with the antiquity of this cooperation and more, if it's possible, with its consolidation. In the beginning, the program was held only for one semester. Currently, we have a fall program, a spring program, and also a summer program. So it's a progress. Since those new ideas for to the present, we have incorporated new subjects and contents from other areas such as business, psychology, science, and more recently, thanks to the signing of the new agreement, we have linked uh, Wake Forest University with an Institute of Neuroscience, and in hand with the management of Cursos Internacionales, as Miguel was here. Uh, a new program that we hope we have we will have the same success as the previous ones. The joint projects will focus on the students. There, there is also an agreement so that professors from each institution can have research space in the public university. An excellent opportunity that several of our colleagues have already been able to take advantage of. One more sign of the commitment that Wake Forest University has made for the establishment of its program in the university is the opening of the Wake Forest University Center in Salamanca in the middle of uh, the first decade of this century, with no doubt supported with the good work of our professors and our university prestige. Thanks to the gesture to the students, despite the distance from the homes, of a place where they can be like home. It is my duty as rector of the University of Salamanca to thank this long period of trust and to acknowledge the wish to continue reinforcing the program. Almost 1,600 of your students have experienced an immersion in the Spanish language and culture in Salamanca and its words and language. They have toured our city and shared experience with other students of different nationalities. They have lived together with their host families and they have known our character, our qualities and our weakness too. To that large number of students and of all to those present here, the students, always the students, we greatly appreciate that you, you once choose your university for the stay abroad. Today we are here celebrating that you are alumni of the Wake Forest Program in Salamanca and also do not forget that you are and will always be also alumni of the University of Salamanca. So thank you very much for this cooperation between the United States and Spain in the very first uh, university. And, uh, cross-fertilizations, 
this uh, this event is closed. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.